I'm going to start working on chapter two. And chapter two has us uh, digging right in and, and creating a simple little project and get you kind of hands on with the products, learn about the interface, how to customize it, and do a, a number of different things. Um, the topics for the chapter are listed up here at the top. So these are the, the things that we're going to be achieving tonight. With any luck, we should be able to get all the way through the chapter. Um, and I think we talked about some of these things last time, but we're going to get a little bit more in depth and more granular with it uh, this week. The thing that I, I do want to keep fresh in your mind as you're working is in our course shell, and let me pull that up on screen here, on the resources page, we do have, uh, I do have a copy of the book in a PDF format. I know some people haven't procured it yet. I also put it there um, because sometimes if you're copying and pasting code, it's easier to grab it from PDF than type it in. And not that I'm encouraging you not to type out code because there's some value in, in, in getting the feel of how Visual Studio works when you're typing it. Um, but it also helps to eliminate mistakes uh, that you might, like you miss a character and the whole thing doesn't work and you're going to back trying to find that one character. Uh, but whatever way you're comfortable with, you should do. Um, additionally, all the source code files for the entire book are available here. I went to the publisher's website and downloaded them. Uh, and what you were seeing at the beginning of this chapter here, he's always got a link to the publisher's website. And I'll, I'll just go there real quickly just so you can see where the resources are. Um, and there's a spot here where you can download the code, and that's basically what I did. There's two versions of the code, one version, version in C Sharp, one in VB. We are working with C Sharp in this class. You want to do VB also? I do get students that want to do both languages just to know it. Go for it. Not a problem. Um, that, you don't have to pull them from here. If, if you want, you can just go directly to our resources page and just pull them right here. Now, here's the temptation that I'm kind of going to make you aware of. So this is uh, kind of like putting the apple on the tree and saying, don't eat it. All the exercises are already done. All the answers for the whole course are in that zip file. And I have had, I think, maybe one person try once to just turn in what was already done. But I can look at your code and tell pretty quickly. Plus, I, I usually have you customize it. But the point is, if you are working, you have a code base to look at and go, why isn't it working? You have something that you can look at and compare. And then every once in a while, as you're working through some of these chapters, the early chapters are pretty easy. But then you get to some of the later chapters, and you start building on top of the stuff that you're doing. Every chapter keeps building. And you mess something up in chapter five, but you need that working to get your chapter six done. Well, you have the option then to go into the source code, pull up a working version six, or excuse me, chapter five, to start building your chapter six because yours is all messed up. But also for that uh, comparison. You know, so the, the temptation is put out there for you, but in order to really learn this stuff, you have to do it. You're not gonna gain anything by just copying that code. The other thing that you're going to get thrown at you is you're going to start building your own website where you're going to start applying these techniques. There's no answers or source code for that. Okay, just uh, an awareness thing. All right, back over to the book. Now, just once again talking about Visual Studio, I know that here in the classroom the machines either have 2013 or 2015 or both. Um, we just looked at our VDI in the other video and we noticed that the VDI even has 2013. So I'm going to be working in 2015. Um, I do have both versions on my machine. I have 2012, I think I put them in numeric order, and 2015. And depending on what I'm doing, I, I run both. Um, now I'm going to record this in 2015. If you look at my older videos, the archive videos, those are all 2012. So if you have 2012, watch those videos. That's a hint, because that'll look exactly like what's in the book. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and launch video, Visual Studio 2015. 
to so have it up and ready. Uh, remember, if you want to get a hold of that product, you can just very, very simply, okay, bring up your browser. You just you can just search Visual Studio 2015. You put that in as a search. Be the first link that comes back. Take you right to the Microsoft site. You do not need to get this from DreamSpark. Like all the other previous versions of Visual Studio, you, you had to get them from DreamSpark to get the real version. This one is just out there. Now they do have uh, professional and enterprise versions out there. Uh, but those basically have collaboration tools built in for high-level teamwork in certain types of environments. Um, the community version basically does pretty much everything those other versions do except for that, that team foundation server and stuff like that. So if you want, go ahead, click free download, follow the instructions, download, install. It takes a while. You know, that's it's not the kind of thing you do in five minutes. It's more like, yeah, if somebody says two hours here. It'll take at least an hour. Plan for at least an hour of time. Need good bandwidth, too. Um, now, I did have a question last week about this product, I think, Visual Studio Code. This is a product that I would encourage you guys to download and explore as kind of like an alternative to a product like Notepad++. Uh, it's made by Microsoft. It runs on any platform, including Linux and Mac. Uh, and it's just a text editor that's built for coding. It's not Visual Studio. It's stripped down. It is much more like Notepad++ with a few extra features. Um, I was introducing it to some students uh, in the last couple semesters, and they were really liking it a lot, and some people switched over to it completely. I haven't you know, gone that road yet, but it is a really good product. And one place I installed it was on my Mac at home, because I don't have you know, as many good products on there like we have on the PC that are free. So check it out. All right, back to our book. Bunch of different types of projects that we can create. We explored this a little bit last time. And what the book is going to do here is they're going to kind of walk us through a couple of different template types. We'll talk about some of those details as we do it. Um, but when you are creating new, new websites in Visual Studio, once it launches like this for you, um, for the stuff that we're going to do predominantly, we're going to skip this start page and skip clicking on these new projects buttons as a general rule of thumb. I know that if you did your intro to programming class or learned you know, VB or other languages in this environment, that's your go-to. Like you come in here, click on that, and you get to work. Right? We're, we're going to break that habit. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is we'll just close that and then come up to File, and do New Website. And then it'll come up with this interface. And we already talked about this last week. But basically, our development language here is C Sharp. So the one thing you want to make sure that you do on the left-hand side of the screen there is make sure that your templates are on that language. And then depending on what you already have available uh, in your installation, you will be presented with a list of potential uh, ways to work. And you can see the default is ASP.NET Empty Website. Pay close attention to the things that are at the very top of the screen, most notably the .NET Framework. And this is something that if you're working in Visual Studio 2012 or 15, I believe the default there is going to be 4.5 for a framework. Um, these are, you know, when you see like an extra number after a version number like this, so 4.5, it's still basically 4.5 with some tweaks. But you can always, if you needed to, come in here and select a different framework. The thing that you should know about the .NET frameworks when you're creating applications is that the user, when they install the software on, on their machine, if they're, okay, we're writing web pages, so strike that. But if they were installing the software, if we were writing software applications, they would need to have that library on their machine to be able to run the software. And you guys probably have encountered situations where you install the game or some piece of software, and it says, well, this requires the uh, C++ libraries and the .NET framework 4. something or other, and you have to install that too. So a good chance you probably already have the libraries present. Now, we're authoring web pages, so it's not quite as much of an issue for us because we're not going to have the code compile or 
execute on the user's machine, it's going to execute on a web server. So that version number there is pertinent for the server that's executing our code. And remember, ASP.NET produces server-side code, not static HTML. It does do static HTML, but we're going to leverage it by putting a programming code in that will execute, compile, and then render as an HTML page on the fly. Okay. All right, so I'm not going to click through on any of this. I'm just bringing that up to kind of give you a little bit of a primer. Uh, but they're going to show you some of the different uh, op, you know, options that you're going to have. We're going to work with like empty websites, and we're going to work with you know, uh, slightly more complicated structures. But for the most part, we're going to be building from the ground up as we walk through the book and putting the components in manually. There are other approaches that you can use, uh, like the MVC approach that they're talking about here which allows you to build an entire infrastructure at a click of a button. We saw that last week, too, in class, right? We created something, clicked the Run button, and we already had a website running, and it had a whole bunch of stuff there. Wow, that's really cool, right? Um, so those are things that you can keep in your head, too. The most power, of course, comes from you coding from scratch, but there is nothing wrong that if there's a framework that gets you, you know, a good portion of the way there, and then you build on top of it, absolutely. That's the way people work these days. All right. We're not doing applications. We're doing websites. So this is the interface that we were just looking at. And in our first exercise, I know we're going to do exactly that. Now, when you are creating uh, some of these sites and the different types that become available, and you'll see some of these as options, um, they're going to have different capabilities built in. We, we played with the Windows or the web form site, right? We noticed how that was kind of like working in the old like VB stuff that you learned where you had a form and you put a button on there and a label. And that's called web forms. What we're going to be working on is kind of building the components more from scratch, but leveraging some of those capabilities. We're not going to lose that capability of dragging and dropping a button, but we're going to do a lot more things manually. You know with HTML, CSS, you can design the interface any way you want, and then having that capability of C-sharp behind it is going to make it like actually do something. When you start working with uh, MVC, you guys will start to uh, learn about the Razor View engines, they call them, which is a different way to push stuff out to a browser. Later in, in the semester, I'm hoping we can get to the point where we talk about that. Now the book is going to have you build your websites and it's going to suggest to you, as I have in the highlight here, that you store your code in one particular spot. You do not have to put it there. But the reason textbooks do this, and they always have it right off the root of the C drive, is because that is a predictable path, right? Where if you were working in your file system, um, let's say like this, you know, Otherwise, you know, you end up in your documents folder, but really the path to that documents folder is a little bit more complex than documents. It really, you're going off of your C drive, you find the user folder, whatever your username happens to be, and then it's probably here, you know, so there's, the path is different for everybody. So they instruct you to put it on the root of the C drive so they can give you that instruction. You can type it in and it'll go right there, All right? You do not have to put it there. Put it somewhere that makes sense for you and work that way. Okay. For me, I have Google Drive software installed on my machine, so I have a spot on my hard drive. All my files are located. I split it by class, semester, and I think you guys you know, saw me doing that last time. Now, I'm going to be working on a fresh folder here, and this is the stuff we did last time. And last time we also created a folder called site. And I'm going to continue working probably on that site, unless they tell me to make a new one. And then every time I'm going to work on it, I'm going to create a version. Initially, I'm going to do this all manually. But you guys need to get in the habit of versioning your work. All right, so we're going to be creating basically a folder. And you know, I, I'm realizing that this is my other 
program here because we have the SharePoint cohort. So we have, what are we going to call, let's just call this uh, Spring 17. And that's where we're going to put all of our work. Okay. Have a spot wherever it needs to be, but somewhere that you can get to it in order to find it. All right, so we're going to start by uh, just working through this first exercise. If you don't have your Visual Studio up and running, please get it up and running. I know this stuff isn't particularly difficult at this point, but we're working through kind of like the, the mechanics and the basics of it. And then once we're comfortable with it, you'll see that things will start to pick up pace a little bit. Okay, so we're going to work on this first exercise here. We're at the bottom of page 37. It's the first try it out exercise in chapter 2. Now, if you're following along here in the classroom, which is fine, uh, which I would encourage, you can actually do your homework here. We're, that's basically what we're doing. All these exercises that are in the chapters are basically going to be the core of your homework for the class. Uh, it's going to be a combination of lecture and demo, as I was saying earlier. And as you complete each one of these, when you complete key steps or complete the exercise, that's the opportune time to take your screenshots drop them into a Word document and type up a little something. I'll probably do that initially to kind of get you guys in that mode, but really it's going to be on you to, to do that. It's easier to do it as you go than try to come back in the aftermath and do it. How many you should take, I'm going to tell you, screenshots are very subjective, right? I say whenever you reach any sort of a milestone that you feel like you accomplished something significant, you should do a, a screenshot. It's better to have too many than not enough. At the very least, it should be at the end of each exercise. So if there's five exercises in a chapter, I would expect five screenshots and five descriptions. Some of those exercises might have like two or three big steps, so maybe you have two or three for that. At this point, when you look at the assignment instructions for these chapters in this unit, you do not need to submit code. However, if you want a safety mechanism for your code, you could zip it and submit it along with your screenshot, and that way, God forbid, somebody steals your flash drive, and you have a zipped copy submitted into Blackboard. And, and sincerely, that's it's a good backup mechanism. You know, kind of feel safe. I, will, I will harass your flash drive continuously. And that was recorded in the video, by the way. Okay, so let's let's do these steps. If you have Visual Studio up and running, great. Uh, I'm running 2015. You can use 2013. They'll look very similar to this. Or you can use 2012. Uh, that will look slightly different, but in essence, all the same. Now, just as a refresher, when I first launched Visual Studio, it comes up with a start page, which I, I promptly closed, because we're not going to use that to create our, our project. Um, and if you follow the instructions here, they want us to go to File, New Website as the option. So you're going to come up here to File, New, Website. If you're a keyboard shortcut person, the shortcut's written on the right-hand side of that little drop-down box. Apparently it's Shift, Alt, N. I don't use it, but if, you know, in some cases. All right, so go ahead and create a new website. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to pull my instruction set off to my second screen. Um, and those of you working at home, that's, that's a pretty recommended way to work if you haven't tried it, where you can have your materials on one screen and your work on another. All right, so we need to make sure that our target framework is right. Now, we already had a little talk about this, and I'm just going to leave this alone. I'm not going to change it. But the book tells you to make sure it's version 4.5. If you want to do what the book does, I guess you can do that. That just simply is the framework on top of which we are compiling our code. I would go with whatever the IDE produces natively. That's probably the best choice. It's that for a reason. Notice, though, that there are versions that are probably newer that they're not pushing. The reason, you know, they don't always go with the newest one is because not all machines have those frameworks running. And in this case, when we think about machines that are running it, it would be the server, not the client. Clients are running web browsers. All right, so make sure that you have Visual 
C sharp selected. Select empty website. And then it wants you also to make sure that down here at the bottom of your screen that you're selecting file system. We're going to store this locally. Now it should also kind of maybe trip something in your mind if you've done web work before. It has the capability to push out to either FTP or HTTP. In other words, move files over the internet to a server as opposed to working on your local file system. But in this case, we're just working locally. And then it wants you to put stuff in that folder name, this one, if I can get this over here, that they told you to create, but you put your folder wherever you put it, so that's where you're putting it. I'm going to show you where I put mine, and that is not in that folder. So I'm in my Google Drive on my machine. I have a folder for this class and a folder for this semester. I'm going to go inside there, but I'm already having a little bit of a conundrum. And before you guys go ahead and click open, which probably some of you already did, that's okay, we can still fix it. Um, I'm going to actually cancel out of here momentarily. I'm going to go back to my file system because what I'm realizing is, well, Spring 17 is where I'm going to hold everything, right? I don't want that to be the root of my website. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into that folder and actually create a folder, and I'm going to call it site. You can call it whatever you want. Now when I go back to that interface and do the browse, I should be able to pull that up. That folder is highlighted. That's going to be the root of your website. I'm just going to say open. I would, act, yeah, the, yeah, I would actually back out and just do the process again. Just make sure, get your folders in order first. Put your folder in place and then connect to it. I don't know why they don't give you the option in that interface to actually create a new folder, or if they do, why I'm not seeing it that clearly. Do you guys see a new folder button? Oh, I guess they, okay. I'm bad. There's a new folder button right there. I was like, who thought of this interface, Microsoft? Oh, oh I, I guess you did put it in there. I would just hope they would make it a little bigger. You know, it says like new folder. Okay. So you can do it through that interface, Sabrina. Okay, go ahead and say open. And then when you're back at the screen, go ahead and say okay. And then it's going to build out the project. The project is basically empty. You will notice that there's a file called webconfig. That's a file that's generated automatically. And if you want to look at it, and I think... Uh, Aaron, you were asking about this before. Is this right? Yes. <laughs> it is. This is an XML file. You know, you know how I know it's an XML file? Because right up here it says XML. Uh, which is basically the parent language of HTML and a lot of markup languages, including ASP. Um, and it just holds uh, information about the project's configuration. For example, notice the framework. It's declared in a file, and when the server goes to execute this website to run it, it looks in that file to know what platform it's running on or what framework it's running on. And hopefully everybody's had uh, success so far with this. Um, that's basically the first exercise. That was pretty hard, right? Horrible. Okay. So this is a great opportunity to start creating your screenshots. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of initiate that process for you. So I'm going to bring up Microsoft Word. I'm going to create a new document. And I'll say Chapter 2, Homework. I'm being a little informal with this. Uh, I'm going to click on my Windows Start button. And I'm going to use the snipping tool. So I just hit Windows Start, S, N, I, pops up on the list. I pressed Enter. I should have showed you guys this last time, right? 
Then I get myself into the mode that I'm getting on screen whatever it is I want to present. In this case, there's not really much to present, is there? Right? This is probably about all you can really show. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back to the snipping tool, click new, and then I'm just probably going to grab, you know, a good portion of the window, something like this. That looks pretty good. I'm going to hit the copy button. I don't bother saving screenshots. I'm not sure what the logic is of, of saving them when they're in the document themselves. So then I come back to my Word document and I do Control V to paste. And there's an image, shows that you created it. And then you can see right down here how my cursor is flashing at the end of the line, right down where my mouse is. I'm just going to press Enter. I'm going to just go to say, um, Try it out, number one, maybe if you want to put the page down, page 37. All right, just give me some feedback. Now, if you are doing this kind of thing and you are running into problems, folks, this is a great place to communicate those problems. Like, right? So I might do something like this, and I would encourage you to do something like this if you have something you really want me to take note of. The other thing that you can do is when you submit the assignment, you can also put it in the submission in the comment section. Just say, you really had a hard time with this on step whatever. Chances are, if you're really having that hard time with it, you're probably emailing me anyhow to help you fix it, or we're working through it in class. But just in case you're working on your own, and I guess I say this more for the benefit of my onliners who don't get this face-to-face, -face, um, you need to let me know. Remember, if you turn in your work and it's not working quite right, but it's turned in on time, you can go back and fix it without a late penalty. So it behooves you to get it in, Highlight in red what you haven't finished yet or where you got to, and I'll let you keep working on it, but I need to see that you're working on it. All right, let's go back um, to the instructions. Really, all this does, in a nutshell, if you go into this folder now and take a look, you'll see that web config file and a debug file that goes with it if you actually try to run it. So um, these are automatically generated with the project. You're going to see as we start to add components, all sorts of files are going to be automatically generated. It's what the interface does. Now, when you're working in the project, the next little thing that they are going to do, <coughs> excuse me, is they're going to show you that there's all sorts of files that you can add to a project, right? You can't really do a website without like some HTML kind of files, right? So what they're going to show you is that you can come up to the root of your project. So right here in the Solution Explorer, you can see that there's the bolded name of your folder and the little planet Earth icon. So I'm not looking at the solution at the top, very top. I'm looking at the site. And then if you right-click on that, there's going to be a menu option that says Add. And the, one of the little exercises in the book, or I think it's on page uh, 41 here, is that they have you come in here and click on this. <coughs> and you can see all the different types of pages that you can add. I know this is a little bit of repeat from last week, but it, it, you know, reinforcement kind of helps to make it stronger. So um, no surprise, one of the things you can put on your website is, gosh, an HTML page, who would have thunk it? I bet that's where you would add it. So you don't have to go in there and like manually create a file and save it in the folder. You let the interface create the file for you. So there's HTML files, JavaScript, CSS files. Those are the top three, no surprise, right? Three key web technologies. It, this version of Visual Studio does default to five. You want to find out? We'll just add one and see what happens. There's the page. HTML5. 
Actually, Visual Studio 2012 and 13 will default to 5 now, too. Um, but, you know, if you guys, most of you probably haven't even learned the old-fashioned doc types. You know you're working in an older version when you see a doc type that looks any more complicated than this. And now I do also want to clarify that when you start working with certain types of project types in ASP.NET, it will throw in what they call an XML namespace because it requires some of those components in order for certain programmatic features to work. All right, so that's an example of that. But if you, you know, explore that interface um, a little bit deeper, and if you want to make it look like what's in the book, and that's on page 41, you click this little icon up here, and you can see all those little things that, that you can do. And some of these things might sound like a complete mystery to you. Right? Like you, what the heck is a JSON file? Don't worry, you'll learn. But these are components that you can add. All right. Now, as we're building stuff, there's going to be various types of files that you're going to be pulling in. I'm bringing the book back over to the screen here for kind of like the luxury part of this. Some of the different files that you'll be able to create will generate file extensions automatically. One of the primary types of pages that we'll be authoring to is what is the default for the environment, which has a file extension of ASPX. That is the .NET ASP file. Old school ASP, it would just be .ASP. So it would not be able to do uh, some of the stuff that ASP.NET does, hypothetically, but a file extension is just text in reality. This is the format you'll see for a majority of things. You'll also notice that they have what they call master page files. It's got a dot master extension. And basically what those are, like templates for a site, and you see how that works. You can also create little user controls. We'll do that a few chapters in. And those are basically little snippets of code that you can create, let's say, maybe like a contact form. You call it a control, and you can pick up that control, move it to any project you want. It doesn't have to be embedded into uh, this particular site. You build in pieces and you stitch the pieces together. Of course, HTML pages, short or long extension, CSS, we got config files, we already saw one of those. Um, a sitemap file, those are often automatically generated or you can manually create them. You guys have probably heard the term sitemap. It's basically a file that holds you know, pointers to all the resources within the project from the user standpoint, like what pages you have and where they're located. Of course, JavaScript, and there's also skins. And what we're going to do now is kind of what I've already just done, which is to create some files. So let's uh, walk through this little thing. I'm also going to come off screen here again. All right, so one thing that they want us to do now on our site, uh, well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this HTML file I created because we really don't need it. If you guys want to know how to do that, it's really fun. You just right click and delete. And there's no recycle bin here, folks. You delete it, it's gone. Okay. All right, so what they would like us to do then is they want us to go in and they want to uh, right click and then add, but instead of adding a file, we're actually going to start with a folder. This folder is going to be called Master Pages in Camel Case, capital M, capital P. And I'm going to reiterate what I said last week too, folks. You're going to discover when you first learn HTML, it's like all lowercase, right? Index.html, lowercase i. Right? Welcome to Microsoft. They want everything to start with a capital letter. And it's not called index on top of it. Okay? So that's a convention that Microsoft uses. Do you have to follow that convention? No. Do I highly recommend that you do? Absolutely. Because when you start working with more complicated project templates, it will auto-generate certain components, and Microsoft has a certain way they like to work, and it's good to follow the way they like to work if you want to be productive. It just really speeds up development. All right. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to add something uh, inside there. And I'm going to 
come here again, I'm going to right click this time on the Master Pages folder. So not, not on the site, but Master Pages. I'm going to right click, add a new item. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of leverage the search capabilities that are available here. Because I can find something on a list and I actually see the thing I want. But sometimes you're in this mode and the lists get really long and you don't see the thing you want. So what you can actually do is, of course, make sure your language is selected correctly. Then you can come up here and just start typing. We need a master page. So you notice I just typed part of it and it searched through what's available and pulled it up. I want the C-sharp version. Be careful of that. And they do want me to name it, so I'm just going to come down here and I'm going to type front end. Now, I do not have to manually add the file extension in this interface. It will automatically generate it. If I want to type dot master, I can. I don't have to. The other thing that you want to be aware of very important setting is the one that you see right down here at the bottom of my screen. And that is the little checkbox that says place code in separate file. As a general rule of thumb, you will do that almost always. It's just better practice. All right, I'm going to go ahead and click add. And then you're going to see inside my folder, it created the front end master and a file that goes with it that's attached called frontendmaster.cs standing for C sharp. All right. If you take a look at the front end master, it pre-generates some HTML code. Right? Really if you ignore this line 1 up here, you're going to see that really what we have is the structure of a basic HTML page. It's got the doc type. It's got the HTML tags. Notice, though, the XML namespace. We'll talk about that as we go. It has the head section of the document. Notice it also has a funny little attribute that says run at server, Means, meaning it has code within it that needs to execute on the server in order to render. There's our title tag. Of course, we have a body section. We got a form, a div. And then inside both the body section and the head section, we have ASP placeholder code. What this stuff is going to do is it's a spot that's reserved for injecting code that we design. The code that would go inside here is the stuff that will be generated from other pages. Okay, so this is kind of a weird for you guys, maybe. Because if you haven't done PHP, you've done nothing like this at all. But what we're going to do here is we're going to recognize the fact that when we build websites, we have components that repeat. Right? Usually you create a page that will have a logo at the top, a menu, maybe some stuff in the footer, maybe some stuff in the sidebar that's the same on every page. And the stuff that really changes is the stuff in the middle. So what this is doing is it's allowing us to create a master page that can hold all of those repeating components. And then in the spots marked as ASP content placeholder, we will write separate ASPX pages that will populate just that part of the page. And then when the server executes the page, it will pull in the front end master for the framework, the repeating components, it will inject the external page into the placeholder and render it as an HTML page. So for example, like right now you guys can see that I have the Google Chrome button up here at the top. I can click that button. And in my other window, of course, it's throwing up, well it's throwing up an error, but it's trying to throw up uh, a page. But I, you know, the truth is, it's trying to render a master page, and a master page won't do anything. So this is really a bad example. Um, but what it would do is it would generate a page, 
and I would right click and view source on that page and I would not see any of the ASP stuff in it. All I would see is the result of all the code. And I'll repeat that concept for you so that make, make sure you get it really solid in your head. And everybody's been successful with this so far? Okay. Uh, we'll come and take a look in a minute and try to figure out why. Now, so this is another significant step that we've completed at this point. So what you might entertain doing is taking a screenshot once again, because you've completed what I would call another significant step. And if you showed me basically the stuff that's on the screen right now, I would be fine with it. Okay. Do you guys need me to repeat the process of screenshotting? Or are you okay? Everybody's good. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the code behind file. Okay. The front end master, that kind of looks like an HTML page. But this maybe you haven't really seen before. So what we have here is programming code. This is not HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. It is C-sharp code. Now, if your Solution Explorer does not have a little expanding box right here, and does not have this file, that means you probably want to do that last step again. And it really, it's as simple as you can right-click that file, um, delete it, then go ahead and do the add process all over again. But you got to make sure that when you do it, and you don't want to do it through this interface, you have to make sure that you do it uh, with the place code in a separate file option checked. Just remember that that one's pretty important. All right, but the reason I'm having you look at this is to just show you that this is programming code here, not HTML. Now, this is a different language for you guys. I know some of you here tonight are also in my Java class, and you're going to start seeing some correlations, basically, between the C-sharp language and Java. There's a lot of similarities. In a Java program, you'll notice at the very top where it says using, it'll, it'll say import, and it'll list a bunch of libraries. Here it says using. That's what, that's what Microsoft chose to do. But then you'll also see that it's got class files, and it's got methods inside there. You know, some weird syntax, you know, syntax you haven't seen before. But for the most part, this stuff is automatically generated. It's not something you're going to really code, you know, from scratch. You're not going to create this file from thin air. You're always going to create the file. It's going to put the code behind file. It's going to put the components it needs by default in place. You go back to the front end master. Once again, go back up to the top of the file. Take a look at the code that's up there. This is different. Notice the ASP style tags, same ones we saw in chapter one, the, with the percent sign, that the tag opens and closes with that percent sign. It also has this little at sign directive that's put in, and it declares our language. It also declares the type of page we're working with. This is a master page. And you'll see all the different types of pages that we generate. Like when we do a user control, that will have control. If we're creating a page, it'll say page. You know, so it kind of denotes what kind of page it is. It also points to where your code file is. Usually it's the same name as the file with a, with a programming language extension on it. And it also points to any inheritances it might have. Now, this is the master page file, so in essence, it's saying it inherits from itself. But it's possible to create a master page that has other master pages that serve it. You know, so you can have like layers and actually nest these things, which is kind of a fascinating concept in itself. All right. Um, once again, in the book, in subsequent pages, they go through and they start talking about some of the file extensions that you're going to see. And uh, some of these uh, we're going to touch and create manually, and some of them we're not. Uh, some of these you might already recognize. Now, if you have 
let's say a situation where you have files that pre-exist and you just want to pull them into this project, you can actually take stuff uh, from external to this environment and pull it into the project. You can do it a number of different ways. And that's what the next exercise is all about. Really, in essence, what they're saying is um, you can pull from your other work or create an external environment. Let's say I created some CSS in the Notepad++ and I want to pull it in to this project. Now, what they're having you do in this exercise is they're actually having you use Notepad. You know what I think about using Notepad for coding? Only if I have no other option, basically. I mean, you can code all your stuff in Notepad, but it's, just, it's a fine text editor, but it's just very limited. So if you have Notepad++ available, I suggest you use that. Um, the one thing that they do point out is like if you do use Notepad, um, Notepad is not always very intelligent with file extensions, nor are a lot of users, right? And I, I kind of obligatorily in every web class kind of go through the process of telling people that make sure that your file extensions are visible. And if you don't know at all what I'm talking about, then you do want to fo follow step two real carefully in this try it out exercise. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to drop down to my desktop. I'm just going to create a new file. And I am going to create a text document, but you know it's mine defaults to Notepad++ anyhow. And they want you to call it styles.css, and I think they actually probably want you to do it with a capital S, am I right? Yes. Thank you, Microsoft, for breaking every HTML rule that I've already learned. Yes, I'm going to change it. So now I have my style CSS file. I don't have anything in it yet, folks. That, that's not really the point of this. The point is that now I can take that file, and in a Windows file system, I can actually click and drag it from here, hover over the taskbar, and then pull it into the application. Really, I want to go to, to Solution Explorer, and let's see if it actually did it. No, it didn't. Okay, so, right. My Solution Explorer wasn't open. Now it's open. Let's try that process one more time. I'm going to drag, hover, bring it right over to Solution Explorer, and drop it. Still not working. You guys notice that? Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. I have to stop the running program. Let's try it one more time. See? Teachers can fail, too. Drag, drop, release. And it'll just drop right into the project. Right? It didn't. No, it didn't. I'll do it one more time. Can you guys tell me what, what is happening? Why is it not? Because if I drop it on the open area, it's not really dropping it into a folder. It's going to try to drop it on whatever it's highlighted. It can't drop it into a master page. Really, I want it to go into the root of my site right now. So I actually have to put it in a location. And now you can see that it appears there. Now, if you don't like the little drag and drop approach I did, you can also grab it from here you know, and have the window visible and drop it in. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can um, come up here and add an existing item. That's another way to do it, and then you just navigate to it. Whatever works for you. But the, the point is you can pull in something that's external to the project directly into Solution Explorer and drop it into the right place. Once it's in Solution Explorer, that doesn't mean that you can't move it around. So if you happen to drop it into your scripts folder, but it should be in the styles folder, just pick it up and drag and drop it. Always do it with caution, though. I don't know if you'll have really much need to pull in external files on projects at this point, but over time, you know, keep in mind that you can do that. You know, one kind of external file that you probably will pull in would be images, for example. Like if you have images on a website that you're building, you can just drag and drop them in or do the existing item thing. That works just fine. All right. All right, I'm moving on to now the try it out exercise on page 46, if you're wondering. The next little thing that they're going to do is they're going to actually have us take that uh, file, that CSS file, and put it into a more appropriate spot. So what they're going to do is they're going to have us once again go to the root of the project and just give it a right click and then do add new folder because any 
good web designer should know that you shouldn't just throw your CSS files in the root of your project, right? So you're going to create a styles folder, capital S, and then you're going to take your styles file, just drag and drop it right into the folder. That's the, that's the whole exercise. Not too hard. So you can do some rudimentary file management in here, um, definitely. Also, if you were thinking of renaming it, just right-click Rename. All right. The next thing that we're going to do is we're actually uh, going to take a look at this code behind issue uh, because they're going to actually have us generate pages both with code behind and code within, or inline as they call it. Uh, just so you can see that you can do both. Now, I, I am going to preface this by saying that, um, you know, as a default, you should always do code behind. But there are circumstances, perhaps, where you put so little code on your page that, you know, maybe it doesn't matter that you do it in line. All right, so what they want you to do now is create yet another folder Exercise page top 50, top of page 50. Create a new folder, and this time the folder is going to be called Demos. And guess what we're going to do with this folder? We're going to demo a whole bunch of stuff. Now they want us to right-click that folder. Once again, do an Add, an Add New Item. And in this case, we're going to make a new choice. We're going to choose web form. We did this last week, I think. Notice as I click on it, always make sure that C sharp is selected. Don't forget that. That it changed, and we are now working with file extensions of ASPX. These are pages within this environment. And then notice the place code in separate file. That is what you want. And that's what they're asking us to do, actually. All right, so go ahead and click Add. And then you're going to see inside that Demos folder, it did add the default file. And if you click the little expander triangle, you'll notice that it also added the code behind. Click on the ASPX file. One single click will make it viewable. You do not need to double click it. If you do happen to double click it, like I'm going to do on this file, it puts you into edit mode. Otherwise, it just puts you into view mode. Did you see how the tabs were different colors? So if I wanted to edit this page, I'm in there ready to edit. Otherwise, I'm just looking. Notice the correlation with the master page. The code behind file looks identical. It's got a bunch of preset libraries. It's got a class that holds all the code, and it's got a method that loads when the page does. So whatever code is inside this little block, that's going to execute when the page loads. Right now it's empty, so nothing will happen. The default ASPX file, once again, has the ASP tags up at the top. Notice that the directive here indicates that we're working on a page. It tells us our language, tells us our code file. And it also tells us what it inherits from. Notice that this page is a complete standalone page. It's got all the HTML stuff, the doc type and all that is built in. This does not need the master page. This will execute just fine on its own. Another thing that you should be aware of in this environment is that Visual Studio, by default, goes into code mode. Okay, Like working in any code editor where you're just looking at the text of the code. However, it also has design view. Now, for some of you that have never worked in a code, or especially an HTML code editor that has design view built in, this might be a little bit alluring initially to 
try to work a lot in this mode and you have to be very careful and you have to be very understanding of how this interface works. If you've ever seen a product like Dreamweaver that has this sort of like a view or design view and, and, uh, and a live mode, it is not nearly as elegant as that. It is really meant for doing rough work only. You are not going to get a what you see is what you get re result here. It's just to see that, okay, it's there. Okay, the text looks about right. Okay, so you don't design around that interface. And I'll, I'll repeat that to you many times. But you can come in here and very easily enter text or drag and drop a button. That's pretty easy to do. It's easier than writing code for a button. Button. So that, that's one of the reasons why it is uh, present. All right. They do want us to come in here and open up our toolbox. Now you might already have a toolbox open on the left hand side or you might have like an icon that's sitting side, sideways like this is that says toolbox. You can just click it. Otherwise you have to come up to your view menu and then bring up toolbox. Shortcut key, control alt x if you're interested. But go ahead and bring that up and I would suggest pinning it there so it's there. And what they want us to do is come in here and they want us to grab a label from the standard set of tools and just drag and drop it into the interface. But notice as I drag and drop, I have multiple spots where I can drag it, right? I want it to end up, well first of all, on that page inside this box. Now there's a lot of interesting features going on here and I know like in, in the room here, if you guys are looking up here, you're probably not going to see this very clearly, but there's lots of little tidbits of information. It dropped it in and I already put some text in there, but above it, above the object that dropped in, it tells you basically what it is and it labels it automatically. If I click on my source code view now, I'm going to notice that it automatically generated this code. And interestingly enough, it's not putting in HTML, it's putting in ASP. And not an ASP tag that's got the percent signs, it's putting in an ASP directive. So it's saying, hey ASP, I need a label. Uh, give it an ID of label one, it has to run at the server, and then here, put this text inside of it. That's what it's doing. Now, if I go ahead and save this, and I think well, it'll be coming up soon, and I execute this page, of course, coming up on my other screen here, it generates this beautiful looking HTML. You guys can go home, you've learned everything you need to know. Not even close, right? But what you should be aware of, right click view source, take a look at what is happening. What is inside of Visual Studio is this. You're going to see that this disappears, stuff up at the top. And then you're also going to see that this changes into something else. Looking at the HTML now, stuff at the top disappears. Hey, but all of a sudden I got all this like weird, you know, stuff in here. There's nothing up in the head section. Uh, it's got all this weird stuff it did to the form. It's got an input control. It's a view state. Really weird looking cryptic string. I don't know where that came from. All automatic from ASP.NET in the framework. These are automatically generated components. But then ultimately it generated that little bit of ASP.NET code and turned it into this piece of HTML. So how does it achieve a label? It creates a span tag, it's an inline tag, it gives it an ID, and put the text in. Now because it's a named object with an ID, I can do things to it with my code, including change the contents, make it appear, disappear, change color, you know, whatever you can think of that you could possibly do, I can control with my programming code just by virtue of the fact that it has an ID. And of course, it does some more stuff here. This is all done automatically. I have no control over it. The, the, the framework does it for me. 
but it really is to show you that when you're working in this environment, you start rendering the code, server will execute the code, render the HTML, push it to your browser, and generate what the view, the viewers or the, the clients will see. That, that's the process. Currently, my page is still running, so I'm going to hit the stop button. All right, and the next thing that we're going to do is we're actually going to add a little bit of code now. So we're going to go to the code behind page right here. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. I'm going to actually close my toolbox for now. And in this spot, they have a little snippet of code in the book. And I'm going to pull the book back over to the screen here. And you're going to see that when we're going to be using the code, they give you both the VB and the C sharp. We are using the C sharp, just to reiterate. So I'm going to take the bolded code here, looks just like what we did in the last chapter, copying it, and I'm coming over to Visual Studio, and I'm just going to paste it right inside this page load method. This should look a lot like the VB that you guys did in the past, right? We are taking an object that's on the screen that's been named, label one, that's that span tag, right? And then we are going to add to it, to its text property, hello world, like we're obliged to do. And then we also run a little bit of ASP code to get the date and time. And then we're going to push that to the web page. So this, this code is going to execute as soon as the page is requested by the client. So the client will go to default ASPX. The browser will request the page. The server will grab the page. Do we have any C-sharp code in here? We sure do. Let's execute the code, do whatever it says. In this case, it says put this text inside that label. So this will feed into this spot on the page. When this page executes, it will render back to the browser. And now we'll have a little bit more inside that label than just label. All right, so one thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to the C-sharp file, make sure it's saved. I'm going to launch it again and once again if you do a right click view source you're going to see this is what happens all that code in the background this is what comes out user has no clue what your code is just the outputting html so if you guys have done php before and some of you have some of you haven't this is the kind of thing that happens in that language too server does the work, pushes out something to the browser. All right. That, believe it or not, was another exercise. I'm not doing it exactly like the book. It's, you know, real, real close. All right. The other thing they want you to try uh, for the remainder of that exercise, and it might be the last one I'm able to do here in class, and you can see I'm kind of like fast-forwarding. Right, there's, there's a few more things to do. So some of these you might have to do on your own. Uh, is they want you to, once again, set up another page and put it in that same folder. So we'll go to Solution Explorer again. And we'll right-click. We're going to add. A new item. But why is it not showing me a new item? Because my page is still running. So add new item and this time they want us to add a another web form but select or excuse me deselect the checkbox for place the code behind they want this page called I think code inline is that correct and I'm going to go ahead and click add and then you're going to see the page is created right here in Solution Explorer. It comes up on the screen. Notice it doesn't have a code behind file, so this little statement up at the top of the page is a lot simpler because it doesn't have to point to you know, some other file. And then you'll notice here in Solution Explorer there's no little expander triangle and there's no file attached to it. And then what the book is going to show you next is that you can add some code 
to the page That's what, step 11? And you notice how at the top of the document here, because they recognize the fact that this is code inline, they already have a script section set aside. It's above any of the other code on the page. It's inside the doc type, but above any of the other code. It's not in the head section. It's not in the body. And you're going to take your code from the book and you're going to paste it in there. So instead of it looking at an external file to run the code, it runs the code right here. It's at the top of the file, so that's going to be the first thing that executes on the page. Notice that the code is pointing to something that's underlining here. It says, oh, that doesn't exist in the current context. That's right, because guess what? We don't have a label on this page called that, do we? So probably the step in the book, if you follow the book exactly, and I apologize that I'm not, I'm kind of like giving you the abridged version, you, you would probably be repeating the process of taking that label, pulling it in there, dropping it, and if you look at your source code, you are then also going to notice that that's also called label one relative to this page. And now the underline goes away. And then if I go to execute this page, you're going to see, in essence, it does the same thing. And if I right-click View Source, a habit you guys should get in, you can see the results are basically the same. So that's really the comparison between doing code inline on the page or doing code in the external file. You can do it either way. The only reason I can see for doing it inline is if you want to kind of minimize your files or you want to make it portable. But the truth is, I see almost no reason to do it in line, you know, almost as a rule. The, the modern approach is separate everything. It makes it much more modular, easy, easier to fix problems and, you know, create solutions if you want to look at it that way. All right, I think that we covered that one. All right, so the next exercise here, I'm going to try to see if I can squeeze this one in before we stop. We do have another class coming in. Or actually moving down the hall in our case, right? Um, all right, so once again, they're going to have us add um, more pages or another page. So we're going to go back to Visual Studio, but this time instead of putting it in the demos folder, we're actually going to drop it in the root of the site. So I'm going to click on the root of the site, right click, add, once again hit the stop button first teacher. Okay, now we'll do it. Alright, so we're going to add a new item and we are going to create, what do they tell us to choose? Which option do they tell us to choose? An empty page? New web form. Okay, just want to make sure. And they do want us to call it default, so you don't have to change the name. Please do place code in separate file, because you just unchecked it, if you were following along. And then click Add. And it's going to drop that now in the root of the project. But I'm guessing that it's got a couple more directives here for us. It wants us to go into Design View once again. And now it just wants us to type, right? What was the message? And notice I just clicked in the window here again. And do you notice how the little thing up at the top, which said body to start with, and then once I clicked inside there, placed me inside the div, because you really don't want to be putting code or text directly in, inside the body without being inside of an element. So in this case, we're inside the div and we're going to say, hi there, visitor, and welcome to Planet Rocks.
Yes, you will come to love this site. Now, what's interesting about this is right now we have this text inside of here. But notice that up on top here we have these tools. It's not quite Dreamweaver, folks, right? Not quite WordPress, but it has these tools where I can take that text and actually put it inside an H1 element just from a drop-down menu. You notice how it instantly applies the style. Uh, highlighted all the text, and then I just hit the drop down here up at the top, Aaron. So one of the you know reasons you might want to work in the visual mode is if you're entering a lot of text and you just want to type, 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 and you can highlight stuff, select it as an H1, an H2, a paragraph, or whatever real quickly. And then if you look at the code, it does that in the code as well. So there's some speed advantages to it, but if you prefer to just go in there and code with HTML, do that. I mean, and personally, that's what I would probably do. I would just, and that's a pretty simple little thing. But what they're trying to show you in this exercise is that those tools are present and you can kind of leverage that um, to, your, you know, to your benefit, basically. Um, the, the next part of this, I'm going to pull this back over on screen. This is pretty easy to do. They're going to actually have you go through the process of typing this in, and then you will uh, come in and you'll start selecting text and using those same interfaces, uh, be able to start changing colors and formats. So, f for example, if I come down here after my H1 and I press Enter, you guys notice how I created a new object and I put a little paragraph on it? So it assumes that after I type a heading and I press enter, I'm going to a paragraph next. It's kind of like the next logical HTML structure. And then right in that interface, I can start typing a whole bunch of things, you know. And then I can also come in, highlight those pieces, and then come up here and start doing things like choosing colors. Just like that. And if you go back and you look at your code, you're going to notice that it automatically generated some CSS for us with a couple of mouse clicks. And you might see that as being really cool. But I'm going to caution you real strongly that a lot of what this book does is it'll go in and it'll say, you can do this, or you can do it this way, or you can do it that way, or you can do it this way. What way is best is really up to you. There's advantages of working graphically in some cases. If you like granular control, you're going to like working with the code directly. And remember, any selection that you make from an interface like this, you can go in and manually tweak anytime, very simply. All right. I don't have time here tonight to finish the rest of the chapter, so I'm leaving it on you to finish the remainder of the exercises. If you want to see how it's done in detail all the way through, I know the pre-existing videos show that, even though they're done with Visual Studio 2012, basically the same uh, thing. All right, that ends this video here, folks, and class is done.